Hello and welcome back to Sociology 101. As you can see, we have our guest back with us today, Dr. Ken Wilson. Welcome, Dr. Wilson, to the program again. Good to be back with you, Layden. Well, y'all remember if you watched the previous program that uh, Dr. Wilson is the premier scholar on uh, Augustine's teaching, especially with regard to his views on predestination, election, uh, the things that we like to discuss here on the program. And Dr. Wilson, I had such an outpouring of uh, response from our first video, I immediately emailed him back and said, Dr. Wilson, can we do this again? And uh, he was gracious enough to say yes. Um, and more, more than just that, uh, Dr. Wilson also fulfilled another request of mine, which was to take his dissertation and make it a little bit more accessible uh, for uh, the layman um, and for those of us who may not be able to read the very large uh, uh, work that uh, was involved in his Oxford uh, PhD dissertation o over uh, Augustine's writings. Uh, and that's exactly what he did. Um, in fact, um, I'm going to pull up on the screen, Dr. Wilson, uh, the, the cover of the book. You can see that the foundation of Augustinian Calvinism by Dr. Ken Wilson there. Um, and a great endorsement there from uh, Dr. Pullman on the back from the University of Bristol, um, which gives a good summary uh, of what you're, you're covering there, and a lot, much of which what we talked about in our, our previous program. In addition to being a, an Oxford scholar on uh, Augustinian theology, uh, Dr. Wilson is a orthopedic hand surgeon, and so he's a busy man and an intelligent man, and uh, we're just honored to have him at Sociology 101 uh, as a kind of our go-to scholar for um, all things dealing with uh, Augustine and uh, the teachings of uh, early church fathers. But in specific, what we thought would be interesting is to go through some of those early church fathers and really engage with maybe some of the Calvinistic uh, responses to Dr. Wilson um, and to others who, those of us who, who do claim, and I think rightly so, that the early church fathers did support uh, a doctrine of libertarian freedom of the will like you and I would hold to. Um, there are some, I know Michael Horton has put out uh, this in a portion of his book. Uh, I know Jack Cottrell had, had replied to it. Um, and there are others who have replied to M Michael Horton's. But even more recently, um, Dr. Matthew M McCann or Mc McMahon, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name, and I'm sorry, uh, Matthew, for that. We're just going to call you Matthew, not out of disrespect in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I know you have a, a degree, and you've earned that. Um, and so uh, we, we will just refer to him as Matthew for now, but uh, with, with, with uh, apologies for not knowing how to pronounce his last name. But um, there at, uh, at the Puritan board, uh, he posted um, several articles, published some articles, in fact, on uh, the doctrines of early church writings and the early church fathers. And, uh, and Dr. Wilson um, was gracious enough to take a look at this at my, uh, at, at my begging. Uh, I, I sent him an email. I said, hey, in between your surgeries and you know, writing Oxford dissertations and all the other things you do, uh, could you take a look at, uh, at, at Matthew's work on, um, on early church fathers and how he's pulled these, these uh, passages from the early church fathers that sound, at maybe at first glance, like they're supporting Calvinism. Um, and and he's at least he's he's claiming they support Calvinism, um, and and Dr. Wilson was gracious enough to put together this presentation, and so Dr. Wilson, take us through this. Um, tell us what you kind of learned from looking at uh, at Matthew's work as well as uh, Michael Horton's work and other Calvinists who have I think attempted to try to claim the early church fathers as a part of their tradition. Yes, Leighton. Um, that was an interesting uh, exercise after actually reading everything originally and in its entirety on the early church fathers and to see these guys trying to do that. Uh, but they're not the first. Augustine tried to do the same thing. <laughs> he, uh, he didn't quite get it right, but he did do the same thing. Um, what's interesting is that uh, they're trying to claim, and I'll quote here uh, from the introduction of uh, Matthew's Augustine's Calvinism from 2017, he says in both Augustine and Calvin would really deem themselves children at the feet of Jesus Christ and the teachings of the Bible, especially quoting their favorite passages from the Apostle Paul over and over again. They are Pauline and Bibline and to the glory of Jesus Christ. That's a pretty, I mean, Augustine would believe that and Calvin would believe that. It's just that they're incorrect in the way they 
uh, interpret the Apostle Paul. Uh, as we talked last time, they take a Manichaean Gnostic interpretation, not an early Christian interpretation. Um, what's more astounding is if you look at his website, A Puritan's Mind, um, he is quoting and says, the early church fathers who lived between 95 AD and 200 AD are just as much Calvinists for understanding grace as Augustine was a Calvinist and as John Calvin was a Calvinist. <laughs> now, and that, like, <laughs> that to me is just, uh, that's baffling. I mean, John Calvin didn't even make that claim. Um, right. In fact, let, let me read a quote from John Calvin, if you don't mind, just jumping in on this point. But here's a quote from John Calvin. He says this, he says, Further, even though the Greeks above the rest, and Greeks is his reference to the early Greek fathers or early church fathers, uh, so further, even the Greeks above the rest, and Christosom especially among them, extol the ability of the human will. Yet all the ancients, save Augustine, so differ, waver, or speak confusingly on this subject that almost nothing certain can be derived from their writings. Again, that's John Calvin. Uh, so, so even John Calvin is confessing that the early church fathers were teaching clearly uh, a view, they were extolling the liberty of the will, and according to him, were speaking so confusedly about these issues that it was only Augustine that he could find agreement with. Um, and so I guess Matthew sees of the early church fathers more clearly than John Calvin could see and understand them. I, I'm guessing that's what he's claiming. Well, perhaps. What, what's very interesting is that neither Calvin nor any of the Reformed theologians today will tell you that Augustine only taught determinism the last 18 years of his life. Uh, for 25 years, he taught the traditional view of Christianity, which is freedom of human choice. So they, they tend to admit that, and that's why I point that out not only in my Oxford thesis and the book uh, from Morse Seebeck, Augustine's Conversion, but I also point it out in this new book, The Foundation of Augustinian mm -hmm. Calvinism, which is meant for the non-scholar. I've taken out all eight languages. You don't have to read eight languages. I've, I've simplified it. So I think it's very accessible. And it'll show you actual quotes from Augustine showing he believed in human free will for 25 years. It's right, right. there. Yeah, uh, but they don't admit that. Yeah, and 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 those who are intellectually honest, even from the reform perspective, uh, have confessed this. Um, we we've quoted from Sam Storms, I know, uh, who is part of Piper John Piper's ministry, and he he admits that this is the case. Um, Lorraine Botner or Betner, I'm not sure how you pronounce his last name either, um, but he has. Uh, I have a quote from him in my book. In fact, in the uh, uh, it happens to be the 100th footnote there. It says, uh, it may occasion some surprise to discover that the doctrine of predestination was not made a matter of special study until the, near the end of the fourth century. The earlier church fathers placed chief emphasis on uh, good works such as faith, repentance, almsgiving, prayer, submission to baptism, etc. as the basis of salvation. They, of course, taught that salvation was through Christ, yet they assumed that man had full power to accept or reject the gospel. Some of their writings contain passages in which the sovereignty of God is recognized, yet alongside of those are others which teach the absolute freedom of the human will. Since they could not reconcile the two, they would have defined the doctrine of predestination and perhaps also that of God's absolute foreknowledge. They taught a kind of synergism in which there was a cooperation between grace and free will. It is hard for man to give up the idea they that he could work out his own salvation. But at last, as a result of long, slow process, he came to the great truth that salvation is a sovereign gift which has been bestowed irrespective of merit. And it was fixed in eternity and that God is the author in all of its stages. This cardinal truth of Christianity was first clearly seen by Augustine, the great spirit-filled theologian of the West. In his doctrine of sin and grace, he went far beyond the earlier theologians taught an unconditional election of grace and restricted the purpose of redemption to define the circle of the elect. That is from Lorraine Botner, uh, Calvinism in History, and it's quote taken there, uh, as you can see, uh, from the modernism.com site. And so um, even, even leading Reformed historians confirm that St. Augustine was the first to clearly teach unconditional election uh, to uh, effectual salvation i.e. Calvinism as we know it. Um, and so it's just, it's, it's, it's really almost 
it's it's almost <laughs> it's almost like you a scholar of your <laughs> of your uh, reputation almost wouldn't even address this unless little old Leighton Flowers said, "Hey, would you come and address this?" Because this probably is laughed out of the room in in, in your scholarly circles. I'm I'm assuming. Is that is that accurate, or am I being too critical? Yeah, I mean, it's hard, it's hard to know how to respond graciously, Leighton. Um, it really is. I would point out that when people make that claim that he was the first, uh, I point out in this new book that just came out, that he wasn't the first. He was the first Christian. Because the Stoics, the Gnostics, and the Manichaeans all taught unconditional election. Hmm. Uh, and that's why the early church fathers refuted them. So you have to be careful and say he was the first Christian to teach grace and unconditional election. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think that's and, important and, to point out. <laughs> and you and you pointed that out real well in our first episode because you were talking about how the the Gnostics and the Stoics of that day were actually using our, the same scripture verses, the same proof texts that are most often used by John Piper type Calvinists today, uh, proving that they 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 were reading those texts in the same way that. Calvinists are reading those texts today. Um, exactly, and I point out that in uh, the foundation of Augustinian Calvinism, I show, here's Augustine's quote, he's refuting those deterministic views, here's the quote, here's the passage, and then I turn around and show the next, later on, where he takes the same passage and takes exactly the same stance that Fortunatus took, that Felix took, that the Manichaeans took. It, it's unbelievable. Wow. Well, and, and I don't think we can underestimate the impact that Augustine's had uh, in Western theology um, it, it is really amazing. And matter of fact, on that same page where I quoted from before, um, I've got a quote from R.C. Sproul with uh, Lingonair Ministries, who many of you know has passed away more recently, but was a, a well-known and respected uh, Reformed theologian. Uh, he, said, he said this, quote, It has been said that uh, all of Western theology is a footnote to the work of Augustine. This is because no other writer, with the exception of the biblical authors, has had more influence on Christendom. When Martin Luther and John Calvin were accused of teaching new doctrine, they pointed to Augustine as their example of one who had taught the things they were teaching. Uh, in fact, John Calvin references Augustine 4,119 times in his work, just going to show that Augustine was really the root bed of what Calvin, by his own admission, believed and taught. And Augustine, by R.C. Sproul's own estimation, is ultimately the father of uh, and, and the, the, the root of this more, um, I guess, theistic, deterministic way of looking at salvation. Um, and I, I think that's probably a fair assessment. I agree, Layden. I, I point that out on one of the last chapters and show how uh, uh, the person Luther was an Augustinian monk. Uh, he, the bondage of the will, that's what he wrote, uh, following Aug Augustine. Uh, John Calvin said, Augustine's so holy within me, I could write all of my theology out of his writings. Um, he was a Stoic. His De Clementia was the first book that he wrote. It was a commentary on uh, the Seneca, a Stoic philosopher, his De Clementia on mercy. So they were both very profoundly influenced by Augustine. So I think that's a very legitimate statement. Had it not been for Augustine, the Reformation never would have happened. Wow. Well, take take us through some of these things from uh, Horton and uh, and Matthew, uh, and some of these things where they're trying to claim uh, as a part of the Calvinistic tradition the early Church Fathers. Sure. Um, I think. Uh, Matthew points out that John Gill wrote The Cause of God and Truth in 1738. And this is the first time I could find something where a, a more modern person tries to go back and pick out passages from the early church fathers and say, these were Calvinists, these are Calvinist understandings. So uh, I have a, a piece of his uh, contents page there on this slide, and you can see he goes over predestination, he goes over uh, election, he goes over uh, limited atonement, he goes over these passages and lists people up to Augustine that he claims are teaching Calvinism. And then that's where these for people that are saying it today, they got it from John Gill. They're using the same quotations, uh, which mm -hmm. we will see. Um, so it's it's an interesting exercise to go through and actually read these and that's uh, what I'd like to do. 
Sure. So if you go to uh, Matthew's website, A Puritan's Mind, he's got a legend for all these quotes. He he takes them and divides them up into the tulip. And so if you look at that, uh, T for, to- for uh, depravity of man, P-, P for predestination and unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace. So if you see the T or the P, that's what he's referencing, and I've taken it right out. Now, one thing we need to be very careful of uh, is saying, what is the meaning of the word? You pointed this out before, mm-hmm. because all the church fathers believed in depravity. Now, that's different than total depravity. Depravity means that as humans, we're corrupted, we have a, we're fallen, we have a sin propensity, a sin nature, that the result is physical death, and yet we have a free will to respond to God that's retained. Right. Total depravity, again, was only a Manichaean and Gnostic view, and that was a total inability to respond to God until God resurrects the dead will and infuses faith and grace. And at that point, the person uh, is no longer depraved. The will has changed. Right. So gravity versus total depravity, big difference. Yeah, so, yeah th- w- this is something we highlight all the time, and it's the same thing that you can do with Scripture verses. You can say, okay, no one is righteous, no, not one. Well, we all agree with that. No one's righteous according to the law. But how does that prove you can't confess your unrighteousness in light of the gospel? It, it just yep. doesn't. And so, and yep. I, I've had Calvinists, it's almost like there's a, like there's this blinders to these things because they can just quote a verse that talks about the sinfulness of man as if it means inability. Um, yeah. No one can submit to the law of God. Okay, so that means they can't confess their inability to submit to God's law and trust in his righteousness? No, it, d- it doesn't ever say these things. It's yeah. just something that if you have that systematic lens on, if you have those, those glasses on, then you read that verse and you go, oh, that means total inability to respond even to the gospel. But we're, we're here to point out the other side and just say, okay, you've got to take those lenses off, back away from the text again, reapproach it, and see if that's really what the intention of the author was. Just like okay. we're looking at the intention of the, the early church fathers, right? I didn't know if I was going to do this, but you're exactly right. And so here's what I do to my students. When I'm reading a Bible passage and I try to do it in a deterministic way, I have to put on my Manichaean glasses. <laughs> And when I put on my Manichaean glasses, then I can understand what it's really saying. Um, and they get the point. So yeah. I wasn't sure going to do that. But when you talked talk about putting on the glasses, I couldn't resist. You couldn't resist. That yeah, was irresistible. I mean, you can't be blamed for that. It's irresistible. Okay. So, uh, it's the same with predestination and unconditional election. You know? So all the early, early church fathers were talking about Irenaeus is all over the place on predestination. But on predestination, God elects based on his foreknowledge of human choices. He foreknew who would believe and who wouldn't. Determinism is God elects without any regard to human choices. Augustinian predestination is not biblical predestination. It's pagan determinism. It's very clear when you look at it. Uh, The next thing on Christian grace we need to understand is that with Christian grace, God invites all humans equally. We're all invited equally to believe in Christ and seek divine help to live godly. But in radical Manichaean grace, as I said, this God has to unilaterally, no human involvement, awaken or resurrect this dead soul, the dead will, and infuse the faith and love and grace in order for that person to believe. That's the difference in Christian grace and radical Manichaean grace. Right. The way I've labeled it in my kind of my re- reformation of Tulip is I've, I've called it illuminating grace. It's not irresistible. Yeah. It's illuminating. In, in other words, he's making truth known, uh, and it's sufficiently made known so that man can respond uh, either willingly or unwillingly. They can suppress the truth and unrighteousness, or they can accept that truth. So I don't, I don't put the blame back onto God for a, a ineffectual grace. In other words, I don't think anybody in hell can say, well, God only sent me the ineffectual kind of grace, not the effectual kind. Um, I'd say all grace of God is sufficient to do exactly what it's meant to do. And according to yep. the scripture, he says these things have been written, speaking of the gospel, these things have been written so that you may believe, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That seems to be pretty clear what the purpose of the illuminating grace of the gospel is for, and that is to bring us the truth, and truth sets you free, if you accept it, if you suppress it. You're, you remain in bondage. So that seems like the, the most basic reading of not only the New Testament, but of uh, the early church fathers as well. It really is. The, um, the interesting thing when you look at that 
that grace, and I like your illuminating grace, because Augustine picks up a Neoplatonic idea that the person is dead, and you literally, this grace has to come in and, and, and resurrect, and the Christian grace doesn't do that. Uh, it's a huge difference between those two. This illuminating grace is some kind of mystical inner thing where the grace comes inside of you, and yet for Christian grace, it was an external grace, like Clement of Alexandria, about 180. 185. He's saying the Old Testament was sufficient for those people at that time, but now the cross and the New Testament illuminate us. That's what God uses to draw people to himself. It's not, not some kind of inner mystical drawing. It's the scripture and the cross of Christ. That's what he's saying in 180. Very wow. different views. Yeah, sounds a lot like what I've been trying to emphasize on a daily basis or a weekly basis here on the podcast. That's good stuff. And you're doing great. I, that's oh, why I, I love being it. on here. You you have a good grasp of this, and I'm not talking to somebody who doesn't know. So well, it's I, I, that means a lot coming from you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. So as, let's start off with uh, a quote that Matthew uses on total depravity on the Epistle of Barnabas. Um, and he says here, when we receive the righteous promise of sin being no more, being made all new by the Lord, then shall we be able to sanctify it, being first sanctified ourselves. And um, I guess I need those special glasses. I, I'm not seeing <laughs> depravity in there at all. Not only total depravity, I don't see any depravity. So I'm not sure why that one's being used, but that's one that's used. I mean, do you see it there? I'm, am I missing I'm, something? I'm, I was reading over it again just to see, maybe I'm, I'm because I've tried to put on, like I said, the Calvinistic glasses, and, and how would I have read that when I was a Calvinist? Why, why would I have, Why would Matthew quote that, um, Doctor McHone, McMahone, McMahan? I'm not sure how. I'm sorry, Matthew. Um, I'm not sure how and why he's referencing that. When we receive the righteous promise, okay, that seems like that's that's when we hear the word of God, when we hear the truth proclaimed of sin being no more, being made all new by the Lord then shall we be able to sanctify it being first sanctified ourselves is he trying to say that that's talking about pre-faith sanctification is that maybe what he's trying to say that maybe we're pre-faith sanctified i have no idea it, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever well put on me. your lenses man uh, you gotta f <laughs> you gotta figure out what what do you, do you see oh, it now? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's we're trying to. I'm Matthew. We're not trying to be mean. We're we're honest. I mean, honestly, that's just we don't we don't see it well enough to be able to even combat what you think it might be saying. That's yeah, how I mean, that's I mean, how hidden it is. I mean, I mean, somebody somebody who knows that, let us know. I mean, well, the only thing I can see maybe, uh, Doctor Wilson, is it says made all new by the Lord. Maybe yeah. since he's saying that God's the one who makes us new, therefore, that's Calvinism. Of course, we all believe God makes us new. We just believe he makes those who believe and trust in Jesus new through the work of uh, regeneration and sanctification. Um, so we all believe that we're made new. It, oh, this is a lot the way Calvinists will read Ephesians 2, that yeah, when we were we'll dead and God made, made us alive in him, that they, they think, well, oh, see, he made us alive in him, therefore Calvinism. Well, yeah. you're assuming that he's making them alive arbitrarily for no apparent reason, um, right. when in reality he's making those who believe and trust in his son alive through faith, uh, yeah. as we can read from other texts. Uh, so may maybe that's the closest I can get. Maybe maybe that's what Matthew is refer referring to that verse 4. So, Yeah, well, let, let's go to one that's a little easier. So okay. this, again, is supposed to do total uh, depravity. This is by Irenaeus, lived about one and wrote about 180. So he says, man will be justly condemned because being made rational, he has lost true reason and lives irrationally. Okay, th that sounds pretty good. It's contrary to the justice of God, giving himself up to every earthly spirit and serves all pleasure. So this is adversus heresies against all heresies. But the problem is, he assumes that being irrational and lost true reason means lost free choice when drawn by God. And I'm going to read another one similar, and then I'm going to actually quote Irenaeus, uh, okay. some from text from him. So the next one that he does is, and this is on uh, perseverance, uh, sorry, predestination and unconditional election, predestination and unconditional election. If therefore now as many as God knows will not believe, 
since he foreknows all things, he hath given them up to their infidelity and turns his face from them, leaving them in the darkness which they have chosen for themselves. It is to be wondered at that he then gave up Pharaoh, who would never believe with them that were with him to their own infidelity. So those might, I mean, those are closer. At least we can find something and know maybe why they're going there. But let's look at Irenaeus, and this is from the exact same work against heresies. So he says, inasmuch then as in this world some persons betake themselves to the light and by faith unite themselves with God, but others shun the light and separate themselves from God. That, that sounds mm -hmm. a little different. Next quote, but man being endowed with reason and in this respect like to God and having been made free in his will and with power over himself, is himself the cause to himself that sometimes he becomes wheat and sometimes chaff. So that's not talking about just back of the atom. It's talking right now, we still have free will, and we sometimes, some people choose this way, and some people choose that way. Those are pretty straightforward, uh, well, I think. And, and if we go back to the original, the first quote you did, you, you looked at it, again, th what this reminds me of, every time you bring up one of these, um, it reminds me of a passage of Scripture that's similar that is taken the wrong way by the Calvinists, like the Ephesians 2 passage I just mentioned. Well, this yeah. one reminds me um, when it talks about those who he's lost true reason, he lives irrationally. It reminds me of the Corinthians passage that's often quoted out of 2.14, where, uh, where he's talking about uh, godly wisdom versus uh, worldly wisdom. And, and the, the deeming of the cross is foolish, because what the Calvinist will read that as is the natural man will deem the cross as foolish, meaning that your natural condition can only see things irrationally. And therefore, you can only deem the cross as foolish because of the condition you're born in by birth. When, when you look at the context of 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, though, he's comparing godly wisdom versus earthly wisdom, because that's a wisdom culture there in Corinth. And so the yep. orators of that day were speaking all kinds of wisdom literature. And so what he was saying is if you continue to depend upon human wisdom, you're going to deem the cross as foolish. But if you listen to godly wisdom, i.e. the apostles' teaching and the Holy Spirit, then you won't. You'll accept the cross. And so in the same way, it seems like they've abused, as you put it, abused the text of the early church fathers by taking this teaching of our Irenaeus, talking about how we can come to live irrationally or with a defiled mind, as uh, Romans 1 speaks of, that their hearts became defiled. It says it didn't say they were born already completely defiled and unable to think or reason. It says they became that way after suppressing the truth and unrighteousness and after he held out his hands to them all day long, after he, he longs to gather them, after his patient enduring them, then they become hardened and calloused and irrational in their thinking. And you can take a passage, just pluck it out of its context and think, okay, look, he's talking about people living in sin and irrationally. Therefore, he must be talking about the natural condition from birth of every man uh, without hope, not what their condition is in response to the gospel itself um, yep. as one who's not suppressed the truth and unrighteousness for his, you know, all his days, those kinds of things. And so yep. it seems like they're doing the same kinds of misinterpretations of the early church fathers as they do the New Testament itself. Yeah, if they do it with Scripture, why not do it with the early church fathers? Right. Except okay. the, the problem is that, that they have here is that there's a lot more passages to go to with the early church fathers in their fight with the Gnostics to prove they yep. aren't saying what you think they're saying. And that's so exactly right. that's it's why... So I, th I think that's why Calvin probably uh, just came out and said they speak so confusedly about these things instead yeah. of uh, trying to claim them as a part of his tradition. Right. There's a great line in the movie The Princess Bride from Inigo Montoya. He says, uh, <laughs> you keep saying that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> right. Uh, yes. and, and that's where we are here. Um, I, I think you're right. I think you're exactly right. So let's look at Horton. He's got Irresistible Grace. And what's very interesting is his first book, has an appendix with all these in it. His uh, most recent version that I got, um, it doesn't have it in it. It, it. There's no early church fathers in it. So I think he actually studied some things and went, wait a minute, this isn't right, um, and left it out. Um, I've not asked him, but uh, it seems to be. Huh. Anyway, here's one on irresistible grace from Irenaeus, which doesn't prove the point. Not of ourselves, but of God is the blessing of our salvation. I mean, 
is is that synergism? I, I, maybe. Um, <laughs> man who was before led captive is taken out of the power of the possessor according to the mercy of God the Father and restoring it gives salvation to it by the word that is by Christ that many may experimentally learn that not of himself but by the gift of God he receives immortality. Wow. I mean, I could preach that now, right? Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's, amen. that's yeah. good stuff. <laughs> it is. Well, <laughs> let's let's look at the next quote and he's again arguing specifically against gnostics um, so this is the same work against heresies with regard to his own justice did righteously turn against that apostasy and redeem from it that is humanity his own property not by violent means as the apostasy had obtained dominion over us at the beginning when it insatiably snatched away what was not its own but by means of persuasion as becomes of God a counsel who does not use violent means to obtain what he desires. Mm -hmm. So he's saying it's definitely by free choice. I've got two more quotes in a row to, to prove that. Sure. But Augustine picks this up, compulsion up idea with the Donatist, and that's where out of Luke 14, 23, and says it's okay to force them, to, to torture them, to uh, say, you're going to die if you don't repent and become a Catholic instead of a Donatist. That was Augustine's approach. And that's mm. one of his things that he did when he switched over to determinism. Wow. Mm. Uh, so let's let's read another one from Irenaeus. These are all from the same book, uh, big book. All such passages, and he lists all these scripture passages, demonstrate the independent will of man. And at the same time, the counsel which God conveys to him by which he exhorts, or exhorts us to submit ourselves to him and seeks to turn us away from the sin of unbelief against him without, however, in any way coercing us. Hmm. Now, wow. that doesn't sound like irresistible grace to me. No, it doesn't. Well, um, and, and I, of course, a Calvinist would say, uh, trying, to, trying to be the other side here, trying to give, give the best possible response that they might give, they might say, well, we don't believe in coercion either because coercion would be acting against your will. We believe right. that God changes our nature so that we are willing, so that we right. want to come. And so that's not coercion. Um, now, right. I, I, would, I would dispute that because if, if I had a, you know, some kind of a potion that I, uh, are in, you know, assuming a potion existed like this, that I somehow um, gave to you to make you want to do or believe like I do, then that you, you that would still be coercion by any uh, definition of the term. Just yep. because you want to do it, well, you only want to do it because the potion was uh, enacted to cause your desires to change. So it yep. there's not there's not a lot of use in reflecting upon the desires of man on Calvinism if the desires themselves are controlled by God. Um, you might as well just adopt full heart on determinism because ultimately it's coercion, but with a step in between. Um, okay. He's not coercing you, he's coercing your will, as if there's somehow a distinction between the two that's worth noting. No, that, that's right. I mean, Origin of Alexandria said God loves willing lovers like Philemon. Uh, he doesn't want this Gnostic baloney. Um, at the end of the book, uh, Foundation of Augustine and Calvinism, I make this point. God is a relational God who invites us and to choose him uh, willingly. Uh, it's not like he hypnotizes us and gets us to choose him. Hmm. Uh, that's, that's not a, I mean, how would you like a, somebody as a girlfriend or boyfriend or husband or wife who hypnotizes you to choose you? Well, you had your glasses earlier, Dr. Wilson, so I can't, I can't resist since you started it. Okay, uh, so perfect. I've got, I've got my Raggedy Ann doll with the, uh, <laughs> The pull string. You. Now you believe. I've got the pull string on the back. See, and look what look what she does. I love you. I love you. <laughs> yeah. So she loves me now that I pulled her string. Now that's not coercion because she wants. When I pull the string, she actually wants to say I love you. And that's so right. again, we joke and we're using just just like Calvinists joke and make fun of us quite regularly. If you haven't ever heard or listened to podcasts from Calvinists, you hear you hear quite a few of them making fun of us. Um, we're doing so in jest and in love, but it, it it does really point out the the silliness from that perspective to try to say that's not really coercion. If God's changing your nature to make you to make you want Him, that's yeah. not coercive. Um, and, and I doubt that Irenaeus had in mind um, the Calvinism's view of compatibility 
uh, ph philosophical compatibilism when he said that term or when he used that yeah. term terminology. Yeah, I mean, look at look at the next quote. I mean, okay. the same thing. Now, all such expressions demonstrate. This is just another another uh, just very shortly after this one. All such expressions demonstrate that man is in his own power with respect to faith. Well, and for this reason, he that believes in him has eternal life, while he who believes not the Son has not eternal life, but the wrath of God shall remain upon him. In the same manner, therefore, the Lord, both showing his own goodness and indicating that man is in his own free will and his own power, said to Jerusalem, How often have I wished to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you would not. Wherefore, your house shall be left unto you desolate. So hmm. that it's hard to get by that. Well, uh, it, it, uh, could you ever imagine any Calvinist that you're aware of saying anything even remotely similar to that? That's and, not going to happen. Right. And so for Matthew and, and Horton to claim Irenaeus as one of their own when this quote and others exist that are even more clear, um, it, that, that's just, I think, disingenuous. I think that's... Uh, maybe that's why I'm, I'm guessing here. I can't speak for Horton, but maybe that's why he pulled that out of his his uh, his newer version of the book. I, I would bet so. I mean, I, th I think he's an honest man. I don't think people are trying to be dishonest. I mean, I I, I think these are Christian brothers. I don't uh, dismiss that at all. But I think he's trying to be honest, uh, and I think the others too. They just don't know. They're they're they've got some glasses on that make it difficult for them to understand. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So there's another quote here. I'm going to skip the next one that I had because it pretty much says the same thing. But let's talk about uh, foreknowledge. Uh, if, therefore, in the present time also, God knowing the number of those who will not believe, um, actually, this is the one I've, I've already done, but I want to point out that Pharaoh, who never would have believed, uh, it's not like he couldn't believe because God didn't give him grace. He didn't believe because God said, I can do whatever I want. This guy ain't going to believe. That does right. not sound like irresistible grace. <laughs> right. that's, that's like the opposite. So this is exactly right. And that, this is something we point out quite regularly on our program as well. Is that w what is there to harden if there's not free will? You know, in other words, there. there what are you? Uh, w sometimes you'll hear uh, Calvinists that I've debated with and talked with. They'll talk about well, God can restrain man when it when it serves his purpose, or he can permit them. Okay, well, what is he restraining or permitting if not the free will of man? Is he restraining what he has decreed for the man to want to do? Because yeah. if all things are according to decree, then God's just decreeing him to want to do something that he's restraining him to do. And that makes no sense. So in, in order to talk about permission or restraining of man, you have to start with a free will. You have to have something for them to restrain or permit. The same thing with hardening. What, what is being hardened if not Pharaoh's will? And his will to rebel against the God of Israel is his own choosing, but for God to, to strengthen him in his resolve is what the Hebrew actually means there, uh, yeah. to, in order to use him to demonstrate his power over the, uh, the false Egyptian gods through all those plagues, each of one representing one of those Egyptian gods, then, then God has every right to mold that hardened lump of, of clay called Pharaoh into the vessel he needs him to be to demonstrate his power through him. That doesn't mean free will doesn't exist. It means just the opposite, if anything. And it yeah. seems like that's exactly the point Irenaeus is making here. Yeah, Irenaeus, Origen, all these guys, I mean, they're dealing with Pharaoh, and they say he could have believed. He didn't want to believe. He hardened his own heart. Uh, God hardened it through indirect means by the plagues, but he hardened his own heart. That's, that's the view they take. Yeah. Um, and interestingly enough, when the Calvinists do that, like you were saying on the other, they must think Satan is really a nincompoop, because why go bother to blind the eyes of unbelievers when they can't believe anyway? All right. Yeah, we, we, we have a—it's right. uh, exactly right. We have an article uh, talking about the redundancy of Satan on Calvinism, and we use this whole yeah. teaching from John Piper, which uh, it, it seems like there's a cognitive dissonance of some sort when he's talking about Satan's work, because um, what is Satan blinding them or plucking the word away from them from if— if he if he if he knew if he just read the Bible, he would learn that the non-elect can't receive the word, and he doesn't need to pluck it away. He doesn't need exactly. to blind their eyes. He doesn't need to do any. He can go sit back and relax. I mean, right. wh what's his purpose if if uh, if Calvinism is true? So, anyway, that that's all all really good points. Yeah. So let's go on to Origin. They have uh, quotes from Origin here. Um, it's Contra Celsus. 
Uh, and Adam, uh, this is a little misprint of 56 there that he has. I, I copied it exactly so it wouldn't change anything. As saith the word, all die and are condemned in the likeness of Adam's transgression, which the divine word says not so much of someone as of all mankind, for the curse of Adam is common to all. Every early church father believed that. Uh, they wrote consistently on depravity. But this curse is not total depravity. There's a big difference between depravity and total depravity. Right. The curse of being cast out of the garden doesn't mean you can't respond to God calling you to be reconciled from your fallen, yep. corrupt condition. And yep. so, again, it's just this it, – it, it, it's the old illustration I've talked about before. Proof that you can't call the president on the phone doesn't prove you can't pick up the phone if the president calls you. Yes. Uh, in the same way, proof that you can't you can't get to God where he is – doesn't prove that God can't condescend to us through incarnation and we can't respond to him when he does. Yep. Um, and it's just over and over and over again, you'll see Calvinists again with the lenses on just saying, look at this verse about depravity. Look at this verse about sinfulness. Look at this verse about the fall. And therefore, that equals total inability, uh, yep. total uh, complete incapacity to respond to God. Uh, and that's, again, unfounded as far as I can tell. Yeah, it's a Manichaean interpretation. Huh. Pure and simple. No, no Christian before Augustine ever thought that. And the word die here for origin doesn't mean spiritual, it's physical death. Um, let's look at another one on limited atonement, supposedly. Uh, the sufferings of Christ indeed confer life on them that believe, but death on them that believe not. Well, everybody believed that. Uh, it says nothing about the extent or the intent or the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice. It merely says what all of them said. If you believe those sufferings of Christ benefit you, you're redeemed. And if you don't believe, you're damned. I mean, that's what they taught. Right. So, I mean, it's just, it's like, well, how do you get the limited atonement out of that statement? Um, it, it, I'm going to yeah, do another one. Well, even on, on that one, even if you start with Calvinism, I, again, I, it's, it's like you were before. You kind of have to stop and reread it again and, and think, what, what do they think it's saying and that, that's another hard one to even even yeah. see how it might support their view. Um, yeah, I, I don't don't see it. Um, and so here's a very interesting one, and, and I want to want people to pay attention to this because I'm going to do one more quote on origin from uh, Matthew, and then give three quotes from origin to show a nuance here you have to understand. And I think what this does, Layton, is show how people can pick one section and say, "Oh, look here, uh, this proves Calvinism." And if you read the whole book the person wrote, you're going to say, well, wait a minute, it really does. So here we go on total depravity. Because our free will is not sufficient to have a clean heart, but we are in need of God who creates such a one. Therefore, it is said by him who knew how to pray, create in me a clean heart, O God. So he's rep rep misrepresenting origin on John 1.12. They all believe that our own free will, we can't get to God of our own free will. God has to come down in grace through Christ, and when we believe, that is what saves us. It's not our free will that saves us. So let's read three quotes here. The apostles once understanding that faith, which is only human, cannot be perfected unless that which comes from God should be added to it, they say to the Savior, increase our faith. So he's saying we start with human faith, and God comes along with grace and gives more faith. And that's right. what happens uh, in all of them. Now, the next one's really interesting because he's talking about foreknowledge, and it looks like he's go going to a Calvinist view that foreknowledge is not part of God's uh, predestination. He doesn't use it. For the Creator makes vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor not from the beginning according to his foreknowledge, since he does not precondemn or prejustify according to it, but he makes those into vessels of honor who purge themselves and those into vessels of dishonor who allowed themselves to remain unpurged. So even though he's saying he doesn't use foreknowledge, he, you see him saying, well, some people themselves are doing something to be elected, you know, to be chosen, uh, to be condemned or justified. It's not just arbitrary. And so when we go to the next quote, uh, same uh, idea. This is Celsus, who's a pagan. Celsus imagines that an event predicted through foreknowledge comes to pass because it was predicted. 
So he's arguing against causal determinism. We talked about this last time where I said drop the glasses of the book right. and you cause it because you foreknew it. That's what the Christians were arguing against, and this is what origins it. It's not by foreknowledge because it's predicted and therefore must happen. So he's saying, but we do not grant this, maintaining that he who foretold it was not the cause of its happening. That's the foreknowledge he's arguing against. Because he foretold it would happen, but the future of in itself, which would have taken place, though not predicted, afforded the occasion to him who was endowed with foreknowledge of foretelling its occurrence. So he's rejecting foreknowledge as causal. Hmm. Uh, that's that's the difference, and that's why you have to be very careful when you're looking at these early church fathers that you read the whole book and understand the whole person and not just pick out one little one little part it's of exactly it. Exactly the same principle of hermeneutics in the New Testament, in, in fact. Yeah. And so it's, it's using understanding the entire context and the entire uh, book, uh, writings, uh, all the writings of the individual author in order to understand where they're coming from. Um, just backing up real quickly for when you talked about um, he did not pre-condemn or pre-justify according to it, but he makes those into vessels of honor who purge themselves. Um, what verse immediately popped into mind, obviously, is, is uh, obviously um, 2 Timothy 2.20, where Paul says, in a large house there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for purpose, special purposes, made wholly useful to the master and prepared for any good work. So human responsibility is still within that clay pot analogy, the same one he uses in Romans 9, by the way. But human responsibility is clearly laid out. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter yep. will be instruments for special purposes, which seems to be exactly kind of what Origen is alluding to there in that quote, it seems like to me. Exactly right, Layden. Uh, that's what he's saying. Uh, Origen was brilliant, uh, maybe one of the most brilliant men who ever lived, uh, and as much if not more so than Augustine. Uh, he knew all the languages. Uh, he was a diligent scholar. He knew scripture backwards and forwards. Um, and so he understood those nuances and understood what he was doing by referencing that scripture in a different way. Um, the next slide actually approaches John 1, 12 through 13 about not by the will of man, uh, saying God offers salvation equally to everybody, and actually quotes this verse, cites it. They who do receive him by virtue of their faith advance to be sons of God, being more not of the embrace of the flesh, nor the conception of the blood, nor of bodily desire, but of God. The divine gift is offered to all. It is no hereditary, inevitably imprinted, but a prize awarded to willing choice. So... <sighs> I mean, it's just everywhere. I mean, if you, you get the big book, it just goes on page after page showing how these guys believe it was of free will. Hmm. Um, this yeah. is just one example. That, and people love to go to John 1, 12 through 13, and say, see, it's not by the will of man. God yeah, has right. to put the grace in us. And that's nobody understood it that way except Manichaeans, Gnostics, and Augustine. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, it seems uh, uh, that yeah, I don't – in other words, the, the passages they seem to be quoting – could be easily taken our way, but the passages that you're quoting in favor of our view, I don't see how you possibly can take them the Calvinistic perspective. Neither did John Calvin, obviously, which is yeah. why he, he denounced them, um, or Lorraine Botner or Sam Storms or other well-intending Calvinists on this point. So, yes. yeah, I, I don't. that seems insurmountable, uh, and I'm not sure how Matthew would reply to that, honestly. Yeah, I would like them to. Uh, I mean, this is a discussion, and, and I'd like to get feedback. Uh, in fact, on the book, if somebody finds some errors or typos in it, uh, you know, do readingword at gmail.com and, and tell me about it. And if you like it, write a good review. And if you don't like it, write a bad review and tell me why. Um, this is an open discussion. <laughs> yeah, um, and we welcome that. We welcome discussion. Yeah, good stuff. Exactly. Um, and so the next one that Matthew uses is a limited atonement, which is very difficult for me to understand. Uh, although Christ suffered for all, yet he suffered for us particularly because he suffered for the church. So this is Ambrose, the bishop who baptized Augustine in 386. That's 1 John 2, 2, right there. <laughs> Just like, I, I agree. Yes. Like, huh, okay. Um, how does that support limited atonement? I, I just can't see it. Um, yeah, yeah, there, okay. try, look okay, harder. There it is. <laughs> look harder, I, I, don't, I don't know. That, that seems to be a... Uh, the sufficient for all kind of approach, but only particularly effective or 
efficient for those who actually put their faith in him. So oh. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how that would support their view. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I mentioned before that uh, Horton, uh, he's a professor of theology and apologetics at West Spencer uh, in California, seminary in California, been that way for, you know, a long time. Uh, but uh, I, I think that is why he took these out. And, and, and uh, Matthew quotes him on his webpage there on a Puritan's mind. And I, I don't think I'm going to spend time going through those. Um, but I do want to point out one on Jerome, because this is a tricky one. And I need to show why this happens and what goes on. So um, in Jerome, he's quoting, uh, he's doing his commentary on Matthew, and he gets to 2028. 20, and, and look at this quote, and, and this, this is interesting. He does not say that he gave his life for all, but for many, that is, for all those who would believe. Wow. I mean, that sounds like limited atonement for me, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that seems pretty clear. And if you read the Latin text, uh, it's, it's a fair translation. Uh, but I want to go to the next slide and show what happens with uh, Jacques-Paul Minha in 1850, who, who put all these together. And he says, I won't bother to read the Latin for you, but my translation is, this is a big footnote right underneath that, beware lest you think Jerome can here support the predestination heresy that Christ died only for some people. And then he goes on and quotes John 3, 16, 1 Timothy 4:10, uh, saying that Jerome did not believe that Christ only died for some people. He was saying Christ died just exactly like what we read from Hillary. He's saying the same thing. Uh, but that's been pulled out uh, of a very small section there where he's just trying to say that. Um, let's look at Chrysostom and, and see a similar type of thing. Uh, and this Chrysostom is a very, even as uh, people have said, very strong support of free will. So Christ was once offered... Uh, was once offered, he says, to bear the sins of many. Why of many and not of all? Because not all believed, for he died indeed for all, that is his part, for that death was a counterbalance against the destruction of all men, but he did not bear the sins of all men because they were not willing. That is, I mean, Chrysostom's exact same time as Jerome, everybody's saying the same thing. Right. Uh, so, this is the, so your yeah. argument is that um, Jerome is making the same argument as Christosom here is, is that in one sense he did die for all, but in another sense it, he didn't, which is what Allen, David Allen gets into in his book when he, he separates the, uh, the intent from the extent from the, the, um, from the application. Uh, and exactly. oftentimes we, we kind of we talk about the application as if it's universal or not, and nobody believes the application meaning the, the effect of the atonement is, is on all. That would be universalism. Um, exactly. But we do all believe that it's sufficiently provided or extended to all. Um, yes. And in that sense, and so though, the, though their words back in the you know, 300s and 400s may have not been exactly the way we might use those words in our language, um, it sounds like they're making the exact same argument that David Allen is making uh, or that any of us would be making even early reformers actually held to a universal extent of the atonement uh yeah. and so e even 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 calvinists like john piper have a problem with the early church uh e even their own early reformers uh in in the debate over atonement at least yeah and i quote dr allen's book uh, at the end of the foundation of augustinian calvinism and pointing out that i agree with him on most of these uh, early church fathers uh in that regard so exactly right Wow. Deal. Good. Wow. Uh, you know, we've got Justin Martyr. We've got quotes uh, from all, <laughs> all over the place. I don't know how many more you guys want to go. No. Through yeah. Go, yeah. Just um, yeah. Just keep, keep plugging okay. away here. We're I think we're going well. Keep going. Okay. All right. So um, we're gonna do one um, for uh, for Justin Martyr. Uh, okay. This is uh, Matthews on uh, irresistible grace. Uh, do you think, O oh men, that we could ever have been able to have understood these things in the scriptures unless by the will of him that wills these things we had received grace to understand them? And that's a, and the dialogue against Trypho. Um, well, uh, yeah, I could see, at least I can see that one, how you might get that out of it. Uh, but let's look at a, a quote from the same work. 
uh, for God wishing both angels and men who were endowed with free will and at their own disposal to do whatever he had strengthened each to do, made them so that if they chose the things acceptable to himself, he would keep them free from death and from punishment. But if they did evil, he would punish each as he sees fit. I think that's pretty plain that he's talking about, uh, yes, God does strengthen us uh, and help us. All of them believe that, but it's our own choice. He doesn't coerce. He doesn't mess with the will. Uh, we have free will at our disposal to do whatever we want to do with it. So that I, I think that's pretty plain. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, on on uh, predestination, he's trying to say uh, he believes in uh, – unconditional election predestination, I'm able to show that all the things appointed by Moses were type symbols and declarations of what should be done to Christ of them that were foreknown to believe in him, and likewise of those things that were to be done by Christ. Well, absolutely, he teaches predestination, and he teaches foreknowledge, but that's not the same thing as saying that this is a predestination that's unconditional election. That's just not there. Right, right. Well, the fact that he even, I get sometimes I've run into Calvinists that, or even just low Calvinist or more moderate type of Calvinist, that just assume that foreknowledge, uh, the foreknowledge of something is fixed, therefore, and because it's fixed based upon foreknowledge, uh, it can't be other than what God foreknows, therefore that's Calvinism. But that's not what John Calvin taught, it's not what John Piper's teaching, it's not Calvinism proper. The reason God foreknows what will happen on Calvinism is because he has determined those things to come to pass. And yep. so if if you think that God foreknows what you libertarianly freely will choose to do, and therefore it's fixed based upon that, that's that's what most of the early church fathers believe. That's not yep. Calvinism. And that's so correct. you can't claim um, certainty as the same as necessity. This is the, the modal fallacy that William Lane Craig points out quite regularly in his philosophical studies. Is that many times the modal fallacy is 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 used there to say, oh, okay, if something is certainly known, then therefore it's necessitated by the knower, and that's the fallacy, and and that's what you were pointing out with the dropping of the glasses and everything else. It's just because it's foreknown doesn't make it causal. It's not necessitated by the knower. In other words, exactly. That's exactly. I, I make my students read Craig because he does a good job uh, making that distinction, and uh, I, it's critical. It's Absolutely. Just critical. Absolutely. So let's read one on Justin Martyr. I really like this quote. It doesn't teach total depravity, but it does teach depravity. Uh, this was on Horton's on Justin Martyr. Uh, Mankind by Adam fell under death. That's physical, not spiritual, if you read them all. And the deception of the serpent, and we are born sinners. No good thing dwells in us. For neither by nature nor by human understanding is it possible for me to, me to acquire the knowledge of things so great and so divine, but by the energy of the divine spirit. Of ourselves, it is impossible to enter the kingdom of God. I mean, does it get any plainer? He has convicted us of the impossibility of our, our nature to obtain life. Free will has destroyed us. We who were free are become slaves and for our sin are sold. Being pressed down by our sins, we cannot move upward toward God. And we are like birds who have wings but are unable to fly. Strong quote. I can see how Calvinists would understand this. Uh, but you have to realize they're talking about depravity, not total depravity. Right. Um, so we're going to go to um, another quote from Justin Martyr. Furthermore, I have proved in what has proceeded that those who were foreknown to be unrighteous, whether men or angels, are not made wicked by God's fault, but each man, each man, not from Adam, each man by his own fault is what he will appear to be. That's in dialogue. Another one from Dialogue. But if the word of God foretells that some angels and men shall certainly be certainly punished, it did so because it foreknew that they would be unchangeably wicked, but not because God had created them so. Hmm. Um, yeah, and it, it sounds like in that first quote that you read, again, sounds a lot like some of the passages that are taken by Calvinists to, to prove uh, total depravity from their perspective. And that is, again, uh, uh, the analogy I've used before of your inability to climb the rope, your, your inability to, to move upward towards God. Therefore, yep. you can't let go of the rope and trust him to catch you. Is that, is that what you're saying? Because that's the conclusion that Calvinist continues to bring. Your inability to earn your own righteousness through the works of the law 
equals an inability to trust in Christ for his righteousness. And that's yep. never established in the Bible, and it's certainly not established by Justin Martyr, of all people. He has way too many quotes in support of yeah. libertarian free will uh, to, to try to claim him as a part of the Calvinistic tradition. Exactly. Let's, let's read another one, just to prove your point. Good. Uh, this is Apology 1. Uh, and again, unless the human race, not Adam, the human race has the power of avoiding evil and choosing good by free choice, they are not accountable for their actions, of whatever kind they be. But that it is by free choice they both walk uprightly and stumble, we thus demonstrate. But this we assert is an inevitable fate that is uh, is tongue in cheek against the, the Gnostics and all these people that believe it's by God's unilateral choice. Inevitable fate that they who choose the good have worthy rewards, and they who choose the opposite have their merited awards. For not like other things as trees and quadrupeds, which cannot act by choice, did God make man. For neither would he be worthy of reward or praise, did he not of himself choose the good, but were created for this end. Nor, if he were evil, would he be worthy of punishment. Not being evil of himself, but being able to do nothing else than what he was made. Hmm. So, if we're made in Adam to be evil and have no other choice, then Justin's saying, that's not right. That's absolutely no. wrong. Well, and, and this is this is one of the points I've tried to emphasize again and again about how Calvinists oftentimes will say, well, we believe in this worm theology that man is so low and so bad and so corrupt. But Justin Martyr's argument, as, as, as is mine, is that actually your theology lifts up the unbeliever and makes them less blameworthy than what we say. Because Justin Martyr is making a valid point here. It's because he's rejecting a God who loves and is provided and he could do otherwise that makes him so evil. He would be yeah. less evil if he was actually rejecting a God who first rejected him. He would be yeah. less evil if he couldn't have done otherwise because of his natural born condition. The reason he's so corrupted and so blameworthy for his his evil is because he could have and should have done otherwise. And exactly. so that that's Justin Martyr's argument as well. Yeah, it's all the early church fathers' arguments against Gnosticism <laughs> and Manichaeism. That, that's their standard line. You just keep reading it over and over and over. That's hmm. what they say. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. Um, I, w I want you to uh, go through some more of this. Uh, I, I, I'm looking at the rest of your, your presentation because you sent it to me earlier. Um, and and I, I don't mind going long. I personally don't mind. I know that, that some people complain about long broadcasts, but these are the kinds of teaching broadcasts that people – uh, that are the theology nerds don't care about the length and they can listen to it double time and all that kind of fun stuff in order to get it all in. But um, but are there any of these other uh, points that you really want to bring out that we you, you think we can't ignore this one? We've got to go over this one before we close. Um, we could we could go over a lot, um, but I think one of the things I'd like to do is just show a chart. Um, sure. That is at the end of my book that puts things in perspective. Um, that's, I, I think a picture really captures what we're trying to say here. And every patristic scholar, uh, of repute, uh, you know, any reputation would, would agree with this. Um, and basically you have stoicism that starts the ball and then it comes in with Gnosticism and then you get Neoplatonism and you get Manichaeism. They're all on the deterministic side. And Augustine is the only early church father up there with that group. Hmm. I have 50 down below, 50, it's actually 53, but three of them just kind of suggest uh, free choice, 50 that say, yes, it is by free choice that humans become uh, come to God by grace through their own human faith. 50. I mean, it's just like, wow, it's such a lopsided group. And when you see this, a chart at the back of the book, uh, Foundation of Augustinian Calvinism, is like, hmm, who was right? Yeah. you got to have a lot of faith in Augustine to say he was right, uh, being uh, part of Manichaeism for 10 years, being a Neoplatonist, and being a Stoic, and believing that philosophy of micromanaging determinism all his life. Uh, wow. that's, that's a big leap of faith if you want to believe Augustine instead of everybody else in the early church. Well, and especially from what we heard earlier from R.C. Sproul, who, who did confess that Augustine's theology, that all of Western theology is a, a, a footnote to 
Augustine uh, and, and Calvin's admission that uh, his doctrines directly related to and tied to Augustine's writing and teaching. Um, all of those things, I think, should be kind of a warning sign uh, to say, okay, are we sure we're resting on the theology of the New Testament versus the theology of Augustine? Um, and, and, and again, that does, this doesn't necessarily prove that the scriptures don't teach divine determinism, um, but it gives a really good reason for you to question that, that finding. It gives you a really good reason to pause um, and, and to say, okay, were the first 400 years of Christian teachers just blind, the, the, those who actually did speak Greek and did know the current culture of the, the New Testament authors? Were they just uh, duped? Were they, were they just confused like John Calvin assumed they were? Um, or could it be that Augustine, who didn't know Greek, who was from North Africa, who was formerly a Manichaean and a Gnostic, um, he was, a, as you mentioned in the, the previous broadcast, a, a heresy hunter. Uh, he was a, kind of an apologist of that day who was really good at putting down some of the false teachings of the other uh, groups around, and so he was revered. He was looked up to. Nobody probably wanted to try to take him on because he was probably a really good debater. Um, it, it would be like if William Lane Craig was teaching something you disagreed with, which I've had the occasion of of uh, running into that when we, we, we went on a trip to uh, uh, Israel together, and there's a couple of things, not many, but there's a couple of things I kind of disagree with him about, but I wasn't about to bring him up because I didn't want to even... I didn't even want to try to defend myself with uh, Dr. Craig. Uh, and, and so I, I, I assume that Augustine probably had that kind of weight in that day where he was a really good debater, a really smart guy. Um, and could it have been that because of his influence, the westernized line of the church really was misled to, to believe things that simply aren't founded in the pages of Scripture? Um, and I think we should be honest enough, to at least objective enough, to say that that very likely could be the case. Uh, and, and, and just at least be objective enough to back away and reapproach it without the lenses, uh, uh, without um, the preconceptions that we, we've often brought to the text. Um, I, I do want to highlight one more time Dr. Wilson's book, Augustine's Conversion from Traditional Free Choice to Non-Free Free Will, a comprehensive methodology from 2018, um, the foundation of Augustine uh, and Calvinism. Uh, it's only $10 paperback. Uh, he purposefully made it accessible. Only $5 on Kindle. The link is there. It's also in the show notes um, so that you can click on that and purchase that um, and, and help spread the word, get people thinking about these things. Uh, the, there's one misconception that has bugged me, the, one of the reasons that really motivated me to start this broadcast, um, and I, and I want to just to say this to you in closing, Dr. Wilson. Um, is the reason I remained kind of quiet after I came out of Calvinism back when I was about 30-ish. Um, I, I didn't start my broadcast until just a few years ago. So there's a good eight years or so that I was kind of, in a sense, a closet non-Calvinist because I had a brotherhood of Calvinistic buddies, you know, the Matt Chandler folks that I hung with and the guy who helped mentor both of us. And I was in that brotherhood of, of Calvinists who would quote from Spurgeon with pride and quote from all of our, our dead theologian friends that we all love and revere and, and hold up our Piper books along with our Bibles and all those kinds of things. Um, and I knew how other Calvinistic buddies looked at Arminians. I, I, I remember how we used to talk about them. Um, it's, it's much like people would talk about like a Joel Olstein type of preacher or more of a practitioner like a Bill Hybels or a Rick Warren. Yeah, they're, they're well intending. They're nice fellas. Maybe even good orators, but they're not deep. They're not thinkers. You know, they're not they're not the scholars. They they mean well, but poor little guys, and you kind of pat them on the head, kind of guys. That's the way I remember the Calvinistic group that I hung with. They think of and they treat the Arminians and the non-Calvinists of our world. Um, and because of that, I didn't want to come out as a non-Calvinist. I didn't want to just come out and say I have a problem with this. I don't, I don't like this theology. I don't think it's right. Because I didn't want to be looked down upon as d a dummy. <laughs> and, and I'm just telling you, and I'm just saying to you, when an orthopedic hand surgeon who has an, a, <laughs> a, a, a doctorate in philosophy from Oxford who has written on this subject stands 
boldly and says this i'm not stupid I, I know the languages i know the original languages i've read through these things um and i've documented all of this this is facts don't care about your feelings as it's been said um these are just the facts of the matter and, and men like you and william lane craig and others who are demonstrably intelligent um are standing very firmly along with a host of witnesses that have gone before us who are also very intelligent that you are you're, you're bringing to the surface here I just want you to know, as um, as one who is not in academia myself, who who is doesn't consider himself uh, really a scholar, but more of a, a collaborator of scholars and a promoter of scholars. Um, I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you for your work. Thank you for standing uh, on the side uh, w with those dummies like myself who <laughs> who who need the scholars to stand up and say, here here are some of the facts of the matter that you guys need to to realize and know. And so keep, my, my friend, keep doing what you're doing in between saving people's lives through surgery. Keep writing and keep researching and keep uh, helping us to make known the truth of God's love and his provision for every man, woman, boy, and girl, because I think that's a worthy uh, truth to be made known in our culture and our world. And so uh, I, just on behalf of my listeners and, and uh, on, on behalf of the church, um, thank you for your scholarship and your work in this area. Well, Aiden, you were right all along, and uh, I just appreciate your ministry. I mean, you, you're the one that uh, said, write the book, you know, to, uh, <laughs> to do yeah. it for people that are non-scholars to do it. And so you're the motivation for that. I wouldn't have done it had you not uh, asked. And uh, I'm just very thankful that I can do that for people, and they can have access for five bucks I mean, online right away. There's so, no excuse. Yeah, no excuse oh, to yeah. not to, not to. And and I've got to I've got to brag a little bit here. Look, I made a I made it in the footnote. Uh, I was going to put it up there. Um, I made it in one of the footnotes of your opener. There, you had the you, you said you you talked about our broadcast from last time, and that that, that this is where the suggestion came from. So, I'm in the right. footnote of a scholar. Uh, that's that's enough for me. I can I can go on to be with the Lord now. I'm in the footnote of a scholar. That's that's all I am for. So, <laughs> oh boy, an Oxford scholar. Yes, even better, uh, even better. But th thank you, my friend, and we will uh, look forward to the answers that we get. I, I, I welcome Matthew to reply. Matter of fact, I invite Matthew yeah. onto the program. Maybe you get yeah. you and Ken, uh, get Ken and Matthew both on, and let you guys talk. I, I'm welcome that. I'm not hiding from anybody about these things. I'm not. I'm not mad at Matthew or Horton, uh, Michael Horton, or uh, my Calvinistic friends who disagree with me on this. I just think facts are facts, and I think it's pretty demonstrable as to where the early church fathers stood on these issues, and so. I, I welcome that discussion, and I think uh, Dr. Wilson would welcome that discussion as well. Uh, so Absolutely. Matthew or any any other Calvinist who may be watching this who, who thinks that they want to defend the, the tradition of the early church fathers holding to a more theistic, deterministic, Calvinistic perspective that, that want to take on some of the, the writings that Ken has offered for us, then uh, you're welcome to do so, and let, let us know. You know where to contact me there at Sociology 101. So God bless you guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks for attending our online university classroom. Remember, this is a listener-supported ministry, so please consider becoming a patron of the podcast by donating online. Join our team and help spread the word. For more resources, books, and articles from Professor Flowers, or to learn how you can support this ministry, please visit www.soteriology101.com.